So hello, my name is Rick and I'm a rising senior in Leverett House studying human developmental and regenerative biology. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Michael Springer from Harvard Medical School about the basics of the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Before we launch into the interview, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work, Dr. Springer? Hi, right, yeah, uh, happy to be here. I'm an associate professor over at Harvard Medical School in the systems biology department. My labs um, become increasingly focused on biosecurity, food safety, and diagnostic development, which positioned my lab quite well for thinking about this um, COVID pandemic and trying on many levels to develop um, testing methods and testing regimes to help get us out of this crisis. Absolutely, that's fascinating. And you know, I'm so excited that we're meeting today. Um, I guess the first question I have for you is, you know, how do we know if we have SARS-CoV-2 and how is it different from other flu viruses? You know, life would be easiest if everyone was symptomatic. What that would mean is, you know, something like chicken pox, right? Where you'd, you'd have a visual representation all over your skin that you were infected. If we had that, it'd be very easy to say, oh, you guys are all sick. You guys all need to leave. Unfortunately, um, you get two sets of people with SARS-CoV-2. There's uh, one population, and this is, we don't exactly know how large the asymptomatic group is. It could be up to 80% of all people are infected. It could be as low as 20%, it's somewhere in that range. Um, but a number of people don't ever show any symptoms, but they can still transmit the disease. We have a second set of people who show symptoms. And these could range from um, coughing, often respiratory trouble, fatigue, um, and diarrhea, nausea, um, and it can become quite severe. Um, and lead to hospitalization as, as everyone knows. I guess, you know, when you, when you were talking earlier, you mentioned transmission. I was just wondering if you talk a little bit more about how this disease is transmitted um, and kind of the ways that we can mitigate its transmission. In general, viruses are transmitted through two different methods. Um, one is aerosol and then one is just called fomite. So it's like surface-based transmission. So like when I'm speaking right now, like you don't see this, but there's tons of little like spit particles coming out and there are lots of different sizes. So some of them are quite small, some are a little bigger. Most particles, you know, above about 10 microns or so, settle down to the ground quite rapidly. So it, that falls out by about a six foot radius. This is why you get that six foot distance. Um, and so when you're over six feet away, you don't get most of this like aerosol based transmission. Particles that are smaller than that can stay in the air for longer. And we can come back to that a little bit later. Now the particles that fall on a surface when they fall to the surface, they can infect. SARS-CoV-2 compared to some other uh, viruses doesn't look like it's infectious for as long as other viruses on surfaces. And so the amount of transmission that happens through aerosols is much higher than the amount that happens through fomite-based transmission. We don't know the exact numbers on this. It's always hard to get that exactly, but probably somewhere between 80 and 90% is done through aerosol, while 10 to 20 is done through fomite. So now what can you do to protect yourself? With aerosols, the simplest thing is stay far enough away that you're not gonna be in the range of aerosols. So this distance through Zoom is probably safe for my spit, but you know, if we're in the same room, you'd wanna be you know, at least six away. And even better would be to be outside where there's a lot of air and wind currents, et cetera, which are gonna pick up the virus and, and, and move it away. But of course, the probably safest thing you can do is wear a mask and wear a mask properly over your mouth and nose so that that will filter out the, the virus. As far as fomite transmission, that is mainly gonna happen if you touch something and then touch to your eyes or your nose. Those are the areas that mainly, you know, where, where the virus can infect with nose being probably the, the, the worst in this case. Um, and so the key thing there is wash your hands. So if you've touched objects or been in areas where there are you know, public areas, be careful before eating and touching your nose, wash for you know, 20 seconds, soap, water, et cetera, or an alcohol spray, et cetera. The uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus, so alcohol will break that envelope and inactivate the virus. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know earlier you mentioned kind of the ways in which we can detect um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I was just wondering how accurate and how reliable tests such as the RT-PCR test are. Yeah, so this, it gets a little bit complicated because there's not just one RT-QPCR test. There's lots of different types of tests. And the other complication is when you think of a test, it's not just the, you know, what we think about the things in the lab and it runs through a machine. There's many parts upstream from the test. And one of the most critical is sampling. Where do you get that sample from? 
you get like an NP swab, which is like going to your throat through your nose, which is something you never want to have to do. Or, you know, is it, you know, uh, the anterior nearest swab, which is Harvard using, which is kind of like the distance that your finger would go into your nose if you picked your nose, or is it from your throat, et cetera. And, you know, so there's these different sampling surfaces, but there's also how well is that swab done? So I think most telling to this, if you do an NP swab through your left nostril and an NP swab through your right nostril and ask what's the coherence between those, if one's positive, what's the chance the other's positive? It's about 90%. So one of the, the main false negative route, and we don't fully understand why it's so high this way, but it's probably through sampling. Once it gets into the lab itself, the assay is, you know, if there's SARS-CoV-2 in the sample, we'll get it, you know, 98, 99, or a greater percent of the time. The flip side of that is, is you know, kind of the, the, the false negative to, to sampling. So that, that comes in, it depends on the titer. So, you get infected and after about three days, your titer starts to rise. So there's a day before symptom onset, one to two days where you actually, your titer's rising. It's actually a scary period because you're transmitting, but you don't really have infection and you're not really infectious. And then you have about seven days over which point in time this, this, this um, viral load's high and then starts to drop off. About seven to 10 days after symptom onset, you are typically not transmitting anymore. You still could have virus for quite a long period of time. So if we're talking about that nine or 10 day period of time, you will almost, you have very few ma machine mistakes in that there will be very few false positives or in very few um, and, 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 and not that many false, um, false negatives um, either. When you start getting like 30 days out, et cetera, your signal could be slow, low, that is kind of stochastic on a day-to-day -day basis of whether you have that. And that's part of why the policy is once you become positive and you have a positive signal, we follow with two tests shortly thereafter. If those tests are both negative, we assume that it was a false positive result, which can happen like a sample mix up or you know, some other type of thing. If you're positive on one of those follow-ups, then you have to wait 10 days during which point in time that covers like the infectivity period. And the reason we don't wait to you to have multiple negative signals is there are people who three months out can still have positive signal, even though they're not transmitting. And so kind of a related question, but something that I've been hearing a lot of questions about, um, you know, is, is it true? Can you have no symptoms and still test positive? Absolutely. So it's somewhere between um, 20 and 80% of the people are asymptomatic. So they're, they're, they're carriers. Um, they're likely able to spread and potentially as well as people who are symptomatic, but have no symptoms. And there's also people who don't have symptoms up front, but then later on develop complications. So um, absolutely. You can be asymptomatic for, for COVID. Uh, and a thing that's complicated then coming back to your earlier question about this versus flu and other things is the symptoms of COVID are quite similar to the symptoms for influenza. So as flu season is coming, et cetera, it's going to be quite difficult to sort out the difference between strep, flu, and COVID from symptoms alone. And so this is part of why testing is important. It helps to separate between those different, um, those different uh, possibilities. Absolutely. And we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about the, t uh, or a lot about the tests, um, but you know, you, you hear about all these sort of simpler tests out there and why, why not use all of these kind of simpler tests that are available to us? So there are three types of tests. There's an antigen test that's trying to detect proteins in the coat of the virus. So let's say you take a typical swab, you might get somewhere around 1,000 viral particles, maybe 10,000 viral particles. The, the protein in that, maybe there's 300 to 2,000 copies of each protein in each viral particle. Now, we, in order to detect that directly, which is what you need to do, you need to have an antibody which is able to detect that small number, you know, just millions of proteins. And it's really hard to do that because it's such a small signal to do that sensitively, but not have background such that you react when nothing's there. And so these antigen tests, when they work are good, but they tend to be not sensitive enough to pull up everyone or to pull up everyone during the point in time they're, they're infectious. So there's a lot of companies trying to make better antigen tests. Um, to date, you know, it's, it's a question if they're, they're good enough. Um, antibody tests tell you whether or not you, you've been infected. The problem is that signal doesn't come up till after you're no longer transmitting. So it's great, you know, no, hey, I might be immune, 
but it doesn't really help in stopping you infecting other people. And so um, we're, we're really stuck at this point in time with these RT qPCR based assays. And the reason they're better, even though there's only one copy of the RNA in each virus, we're able to amplify that to the point that you have, you know, to the 30th, like billions and billions of copies of the RNA, for example, from a single viral particle. And so that's the secret of why these assays work is because we can amplify it. We know how to amplify RNA. And so, and that sensitivity, unfortunately, is needed to catch these asymptomatic people, to catch people early on in infection, et, et cetera. So I, I really hope that some of these other techniques get to the point that we can use them. And I know some people are thinking they're part of the solution. It really comes down to what percent of the people that are sick are pulled out by that. And the concern is people will change behavior if they got a negative test score there, such that their behavior becomes riskier to the same extent that the people who got caught got pulled out. So there's lots of features there that make it, make it complicated. Totally. Um, and so you've, you've mentioned behavior and we talked a little bit about social distancing earlier, but are there any other best practices that you think that we as community members can take to keep each other safe? Yeah, it's, it's basically kind of the same advice you would have gotten in 1918, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, um, you know, and look, mental health wise, like we can't just all lock ourselves in a room and eat food. We got to interact with people, be smart about it, be outside when you can, you know, um, stay at a distance when, when, when possible. Um, and if you're gonna be close, um, wear masks. So, I mean, in the hospitals, people wear masks, they wear protective gear. If you do it properly, you can stop getting infected. But, you know, every time you take your mask off or have it over your, just over your mouth and not over your nose, wear things improperly, that, you know, contributes to your chance of getting it and your chance of infecting other people unwittingly. So those are, those are the key things, mask, and, mask, hands, maintain distance. And, you know, I hate to say this for college age kids, but um, alcohol is usually the single, you know, least conducive thing to maintaining behavior such that you're gonna not infect people, which is why, you know, there's been so much infection that's happening related to bars and partying. You know, not that there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol, but be cognizant about the environment that you're in and what it means to be safe in those environments. You know, fact of the matter is, we're not gonna stop people from getting infected. You know, there's, there's SARS is going around, et cetera. Our goal really is to stop the spread of infection. So people get infected and once you've been infected, you know, it takes about four days before you start infecting other people. So our goal really is to make sure we stop community-based infection. So we stop people who are infected from infecting the people around them. And so, you know, the type of testing frequency we have, you know, getting tested every two to three days, that's really to make sure we catch people before they infect the people around them. So, you know, it's important to take this seriously. People at all age ranges um, can have negative repercussions from COVID. College age kids are probably better off than most, but there's a secondary consequences of if college kids gets infected, they're gonna be infecting people around them. You know, our policies are set up, hopefully to create a safe environment where we can continue to be open and have people to interact as much as possible with blocking this community-based transmission. You know, that's what we're really trying to stop. We're not gonna stop all infections, but we should be able to stop community-based tra transmission. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us today, Dr. Springer. You know, I wish you the best in your work and we appreciate all that you're doing to help keep our community healthy in the months to come. Well, thank you.